We're going to be in John chapter 1. We're going to be at the end, starting in verse 35. John chapter 1, verse 35. And we're going to carry all the way to the end of this chapter. And this is a great uh, little, uh, as Jesus, as John has set Jesus up as God Almighty, and he set him up as the Son of God, uh, deity, he's gone very uh, far to establish the concepts of, John, of Jesus' deity to the point where throughout the, the first chapter of John, he, he calls Jesus 16 different names to establish the reality that Jesus is divine. And so as he goes through this, we see him preparing us for what Jesus is about to do. And as Jesus moves and goes, all of the reactions, all of the signs, all of the miracles that you're going to see is all based around the deity of Christ. And interestingly enough, as Jesus is now moving and going, we're going to see here at the very end of the chapter, he's going to call his first four disciples. And we don't see him calling all of the 12 that we have But we see just these four. John specifically takes these four men and how they came to follow Jesus. And he puts them in in about uh, 15 verses here that we want to focus on and look at as we go through it. So as we do this, we're going to ask several questions leading us up to why it's so important to make disciples. Why is it important for the church to be about discipleship? And as we go into that, we're going to ask some questions as to like uh, specifically what it is. Now, to give you context of what a Jewish disciple was, it wasn't much different than what we see today when we think about the term disciple. Uh, Jewish children, they would be educated uh, in the scriptures up to about the age of 13 years old. This is where you get the, the concept of the bar mitzvah and the bat mitzvah. They would be educated in the scriptures and not in necessarily mathematics and science and all those other things. They would be educated in the Pentateuch, in the law. They would go back and they would study to the place where they would memorize. They would literally memorize the first five books of the Old Testament. Now imagine that. Imagine memorizing Leviticus. Why why y'all groaning? It's the word of God, people. No, it's, it's, trust me, I get it. They would memorize this up to about the age of 13 when they would become a man, all right, or they would become a woman. And the one specifically uh, would, from that point, would then go into uh, the apprenticeship. They would take on apprentice roles with other uh, tradesmen and worksmen, and they would learn trades like leather crafting, shoemaking. Uh, they would learn, uh, they would become farmers and shepherds and woodworkers and carpenters and all of this. And then by about the age of 14, 15, so about two years after that, that, that process of them moving from the school to the home and to the workplace, what would happen is they would then begin uh, to be selected by rabbis, teachers, men who were trained in the, 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 the law and the Old Testament and uh, the, the, the prophets, the writings of the prophets, and they would be trained beyond that point. These men would come and they would gather up a few, just a few of these ones who had been in their trade for a couple years who were exceptional. I mean exceptional. They wouldn't just take anybody they went around and they would, they, there was a reputation and they would find the kids who knew the law, who had the reputation of, of a learner, someone who was, was prepared to give their life and spend their life teaching. Because a rabbi in the law was actually forbidden to get money for his teaching. He had to have a trade as well. That's why they went from the, from the school to the trade and then they would move into being a rabbi or being a teacher or a disciple of a rabbi to become a rabbi. And so these teachers weren't like us. We build buildings, we rent buildings like this, and we gather together and we we have uh, all over the city places where pastors and shepherds are coming together to teach and to, to worship and to study. They didn't do that. These teachers would go from town to town and they would travel like a, like a circuit riding preacher. You remember that? Uh, back in the day as the, pi- the pioneers were, were expanding across the, uh, the country, the only way uh, pastors and, and or excuse me, cities and towns could get the gospel sometimes was they would have an educated pastor who would make a circuit and he would hit town after town and he would have his circuit so that the people could hear the word of God and they could hear the gospel. It was real similar back then. But as these men picked up these young boys, these 14, 15, 16-year-old young men, they would bring them with them, and they would go with the rabbi to learn from the rabbi. 
They were called disciples. They were called disciples. And disciples in the Greek just means learner, really. It means student almost. Uh, the, the way Jesus did discipleship was very different than the way the Jewish uh, rabbis did. Jesus made the disciples family. And you see this. When Jesus uh, uh, is being, uh, being asked about his mother and his, his, his brothers, he says, where are they? They're sitting right here. This is my family. These are my brothers. These are those who I consider my family. And so Jesus had a little different idea about what it meant to be a disciple. So the concept of discipleship is very simple for most of us. It's the idea of becoming like Jesus or becoming like the master, like the one you're learning from. And that would be Christ to us. But I want to take it a step further. Let's ask the question, what is discipleship? And let's take it another step. I don't just believe, and this is me, but I don't just believe discipleship is just about learning more stuff. Okay? I don't. I have my own little definition. It'll be on the screen for you. I believe that being a disciple is about falling more in love with God. See, if it was just about knowledge, then knowledge becomes the end and not the means, right? Think about that. How many uh, churches and Bible studies and places have you been where you have felt or been moved into a place of discipleship, right? Right? That's what good Christians do. Let's just put air quotes around this. That's what good Christians do. We, we want to be discipled. We want to grow in our faith. But as a church, oftentimes we program our discipleship around learning, around information. And it, in our minds, it becomes information and knowledge becomes the, the end. It's what we do. We go to learn more and then we've got this big brain, right? This big brain full of great information. The problem is... is Nowhere in the text of the Bible, from tip to tail, from anywhere, from Genesis to Revelation, does it explain or say, go and learn a whole lot more and you've made it. It doesn't say that. Matter of fact, I'm going to put a scripture on your screen. This is what Jesus says is the greatest thing we could do. Look at it. It says this is Matthew 22. They ask him the question, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and foremost commandment. Do you think that has changed? Do you think that when Jesus came that he changed that law? He did not. Jesus is the completion. He's the goal of this law. But he didn't change it. He fulfilled it. So our goal, your goal, my goal, is this right here. To obey the greatest commandment. Your goal is not just to become another uh, sponge of knowledge and information. Discipleship isn't just about gaining more information. It's about learning how to do this. How do we as Christians love God more? So I'll give you a little progression here real fast. Knowledge, it, it's, it's going to educate us. But what knowledge should be doing is it should be educating us to movement, right? Or to actions. And then actions, what they're going to do is that's going to gain us experience. And as we go through and experience things and life by the word of God, moving us, gaining experiences, then it's going to deepen us in our love. Do you see that? I'm going to say it again. Knowledge moves us to act. Action gains us experience. Experience deepens our love. So check this out. If we get involved in the church and we get involved in growing and wanting to be more like Jesus and we end at knowledge, what happens? Does it deepen our love? It really doesn't. Now, it can, it, it can help us to see God more clearly, but let me tell you what just gaining knowledge does. Knowledge without experience breeds arrogance. Can I say that again? When we gain knowledge... And we don't take that knowledge and we go outside this world and we apply that knowledge and we act upon what we've learned right here. What happens is we become what, a, a very self-centered, self-focused, arrogant church. We think we have all the answers. We think we're the smartest people in the room. We, uh, as you get smarter and you know more and you start focusing more on yourself... 
What happens when you screw up? It makes your screw-ups impossible to confess almost, right? And the more you gain, the better you look, and the better the people see you uh, as the, man, this guy, Wilson, he's got it together. He's super smart. Look how much he knows. What happens when Wilson screws up? Can Wilson come to you? Can Wilson confess? Can, or does he have to hide and have to lie and have to, 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 to make sure you don't find out so he can keep his reputation and his name good? You see? This is the problem that we have in current day discipleship. When churches only focus on just gaining information and not taking that information, applying it to my heart that I might then act upon it, gain the experience I need that I might then go out and deepen my love for Christ, for his word, and for the world. Give you, give you another verse. Jesus said it this way. And I'm going to kind of work backwards from this. This is John chapter 13, verse 35. This is a famous text. I'm just going to pull one verse out so you can see it. It says, by this, all men will know that you are my disciple. Look at the last half. Because you are super smart, right? They're going to know you're my disciple because you are the most educated fools on the planet. No. How are they going to know that you're my disciple? By you, how you love. By your love. Now, do you, let me ask you a question. Do you feel like that's how the world sees the church? Are we, do they see us as disciples of Christ? Typically, does the world have a problem with Christ? Overall, they usually don't. Now, they may not see him as God, as, as John paints the picture of him, but they see all, they've seen the great things that he's done. I mean, Jesus doesn't have a bad reputation. Who has the bad reputation? We do. And can I tell you that discipleship may be the most important Thing that the church does if we don't pass on the right way of knowing God and falling deeper in love with him the church is dead it's a dead church we have to pass this on correctly we have to do this right that's why we have what we call app groups why did we call it app groups and not uh, Bible studies or whatever we call them app groups because our whole goal in that group, and, and if you're a part of one, you realize this, the goal is not just to go and study and not just to go and, and gain information. We have times of study, but what else do we have times of? We have times of fellowship and, and enjoyment and community and, and building on one another. Our app groups get involved in what's going on in the church. They serve. They're also moving out into the world. Why do we do that? How come we don't just have this holy huddle of Christians that just keep coming and, and inbreeding, you know? That's what we call it, where Christians come and they just grow and grow and grow and grow and they never go outside and you never see the gospel move outside of the church. We just kind of make ourselves feel good and we, more and more Christians maybe come to the church because, oh, that's a great speaker or we like that church, they serve good coffee and we just kind of have this inbred church. And that's what happens. We have our app groups set up because we don't want that. Because that's not what Jesus did. And that's what we're going to see as we move through this. We're going to see Jesus do something different. So the next thing we're going to see is we're going to walk through this text. And it's quite a long text, but we're going to look at six things specifically that, that really we could say this, this is what it is to be a disciple. So the question is what makes someone a disciple? What specifically makes you a disciple? Well, the first thing is this. I believe that disciples are followers. I believe disciples are followers. Now, sometimes being a follower might get a bad reputation. We all in America, we want to be leaders, right? We talk, I talk to my son about what it means to be a leader. I'm always instilling in him, man, you need to lead. Why, and that's good. We, why do we do that? Because we want him to be a life, a world changer. We want him to set the pace for his friends. I want my son and my daughter both to go out into the world. And as they're with their friends, I want them to see Christ in them. And I want them to lead them towards a deeper relationship with Jesus. That's what I want. That's what we all want for our children, right? Leadership. But can you be a good leader if you're not a good follower? It starts here. Aristotle said this, the famous... Uh, 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 philosopher, he said, who, he who cannot be a good follower cannot be a good leader. And I think this is true. And this is why Jesus not only commanded us to go make disciples, 
in Matthew chapter 28, but he modeled the perfect way. And look at what he does. Let's, as we go into the text, look at verse 35. He says, again, the next day, so this is day three, I believe. John was standing with two of his disciples. This is the Baptist. John the Baptist, remember, he had a, a pretty extensive ministry. He had built the reputation that he was uh, uh, gathering men uh, at the Jordan and all over Ju uh, Galilee and Judea, baptizing them. They, uh, the Pharisees sent out delegation to find out who he was. And so he's now standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he, was walked, as he walked up and he said, Behold the Lamb of God. Now this is, he says it again. Remember last week he said it when Jesus came to him. We don't see it, but it was during the time of Christ's baptism. We don't see it in the book of John that way. But as now it's the next day and he's come up and he says, There he is again, the Lamb of God. Now who is John saying this to? He's saying it to his disciples. Hey guys, look. There's the Son of God. And notice what they do. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Now what you're going to see here is that they left John. And you're going to see as we get into chapter 3, that's going to become more apparent that John's disciples were bailing on him for this man to follow Jesus, to go after Jesus. So the point here that we first see in the text is that these guys become followers. And this theme carries through all the Gospels, the Synoptics and John, that it carries through that these men were followers. They literally, just like a rabbi, followed Jesus. Now, can you imagine? Think about them for a second. Um, as we go through this, you're going to see who these men are as we go down. But can you imagine being a kid? 13 you turn into a man, you take on your apprenticeship, you start moving into uh, being uh, uh, taught. Ladies would be moving into apprenticeships in the home where they were being taught and they were being educated. Um, year goes by, you don't get a knock on your door. Two years goes by, you don't get a knock on your door. You turn 18, you know there's no hope, no rabbi's going to come pick you. Nobody's coming to your door to gather you up to be the, the next teacher of Israel. You get into your 20s, into your 30s. There's no hope, right? I mean, that, that, that ship has sailed. And you find this guy in the desert baptizing people. And you go to him. And you want to be his disciple. You start following this guy. And now you find he actually knows the Lamb of God, the Messiah, now think about where they are. This is a radical shift for these men. These men were tradesmen, as we, as we know. And now they're, gonna, they're following Jesus. Do you realize that for those who had wives, you know what their wives were doing? Their wives were taking care of their business. Do you ever go back and read Proverbs 31 where the wife is, is taking care of the home, running the business? Where's the husband in Proverbs 31? Do you all remember? He's at the gate. <laughs> and it's not like he's doing nothing, but he's at the gate. He's doing business at the gate. He's talking at the gate. What's the wife doing? She's working hard so that her husband can go out there and do that. It's interesting, these men who had wives, who became disciples of John and became disciples of Jesus, it was amazing that they were even allowed the opportunity to go. Let me just say it that way. So here we are. These men leave their work. They leave what they've known and they go to follow. And that's the same way that we see for disciples today. Not that they leave their work, but they leave behind this apathy. I'll never be able to do that. Why even try? And they take on this mentality of I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to be his man. Now watch what happens. As we go through this, not only are they followers, but they commit. They're very committed in order to step away from everything, you've got to give up a lot. Look at verse 20, uh, 38. So Jesus sees them and he turns to them and he saw them following. And he said to them, what do you seek? Now what he's asking here is really two possible things. In other words, what's on your mind, fellas? I see you following what's on your mind. But I think more importantly what Jesus is saying is, what do you seek in this life? What are you coming after me for? Why are you following me? It would be very hard, you got to think, for Jesus to be walking down the street. 
He makes a left on uh, San Jacinto. Then he makes a right on, uh, on uh, uh, you know, William Travis Lane, if he was in Texas, right? And uh, he goes down to Houston as he's on Houston Street. And the whole way, these two fellas are following him. It's hard to, he's not breaking them loose, right? So he turns as he sees them following. He says, what do you seek? What are you in this for? Look at what they say. And they said to him, Rabbi. Now notice, John is translating here. You're going to see several parentheses. It's going to happen three times in this little text we're going to be looking at. And Rabbi means teacher. He's translating this because this is primarily a, Jew, uh, excuse me, a Gentile audience that reads, is going to be reading John's letter, and he knew that. So he translated things like rabbi, which would be a Hebrew phrase, so that the, the Gentiles who read this could understand. He says, they say to him, Rabbi, where are you staying? Now, why would you even ask that? This almost like for us would be a presumptuous question. You're here. We know you're traveling through. Where are you staying at? The reason they're asking him that is because they want to go where he's at. They want to stay with him. And that would be their way of showing, hey, I'm not going home. I don't want to go home. I want to come where you are. Where are you staying? I want to come stay with you. Keep reading the text in verse 39. And he said to them, come and you will see. So notice what has to happen. He doesn't just say, oh, I'm down at the Marriott. If you want to come by and check me out. He says, you've got to follow me to find out where I'm at. Do you see that? He doesn't just give them the answer. I'm, I'm staying at Judas's house, or I'm staying at Barnabas' house, or I'm down on the, on the third corner on the left on the yellow house with the big tall columns. He says, you want to know? You're going to have to keep walking. You want to see me? You want to see who I am? You want me to reveal if I'm truly the Son of God? Then you're going to have to start walking. Do you see this? There's a commitment that needs to be made. If you're going to be my disciple, come. Follow. You follow me, I'll show you. Watch, go through the text with me. Come and see. So they came and they saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day. For it was about the tenth hour. It was late. So they, we'll stay here. We'll stay the night. We want to be with you. There's a commitment that's made. Notice this is a great story out of Luke chapter 14. Jesus is trying to explain the cost of discipleship. In Luke chapter 14, he's talking to uh, disciples and um, he's trying to explain to them just how far it's going to go, how far you're going to have to go with this thing called discipleship. If you're going to be my disciple, what's it going to take? This is found in verse uh, 25 of Luke 14. He says, now a large crowd were going along with him. You can imagine the, 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 the stir. If a miracle happened in this town, and then a miracle happened in that town, everybody's going to be following Jesus from town to town to town. And so he turns to them, and he says, if anyone comes to me, in other words, if you want to come to me, you want to be my disciple, and he does not hate his own father and mother and wife, and child, and brothers, and sisters. Yes, and even his own life. He can't be my disciple. Now talk about commitment. He just named off <coughs> every important person in your life. Mom, dad, friends, brothers, sisters. Heck, yourself. Everybody. And notice with the word hate there, he's not meaning you've got to have enmity that you've got to all of a sudden become your, your own enemy. He's just saying that you have to love me more than all these other things to the place where your love for me makes ev all your love for everyone else look like hate. Does that make sense? You've got to love me. You've got to come after me. You've got to be committed to me. Because guess what? If you're not... You will follow everything else. There is no neutral space. You don't become a follower of Jesus Christ and instantly get like uh, one of those uh, tram or uh, you ever go to the airport where you stand on the, the little walkway and it moves you real fast along? That's not, what this, that's not the life of, of a follower of Jesus. You don't just go, oh, I've made it. And you get on the little moving walkway and all of a sudden you start moving and you wave at your friends as they're trying to hustle to their airplane, right? No, 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 no. If anything, becoming a follower of Jesus means that you have to now work. You've got to commit. You've got to move in the direction of Christ so that these things aren't going to distract me anymore. This stuff I'm going to leave behind because he's the one that matters. 
Discipleship means commitment. The next thing you see in the text as he's walking through it is, is now they're going to start to share their story. Now, can you imagine this? You've just seen and spent the night with the Son of God. Don't you know the conversation was awesome? Have you ever met somebody who, and, and, and trust me, I don't think that Jesus wowed them with his theological prowess. I don't think Jesus was telling them stuff about how he created the daffodil. You want to know what I think Jesus was doing, Christian? Listen, I think Jesus was asking them questions about their life. This is me personally. This is, again, let's step. This is Wilson, okay? I think he was just, hey, tell me about yourself. Tell me, how did you, how did you become a fisherman? How did you become a carpenter? How did you get into this? Hey, you know what? I grew up in Nazareth. Where did, who, did you know so-and-so? I think there was this gathering. of. They felt so known. They felt so loved. All of a sudden, he was pouring into them and wanting to know about them. I, I guarantee you this wasn't just a, an exercise where they just sat there and were, were completely quiet while Jesus wowed them. I think he wowed them with a love that they had been rejected from. I think he wowed them with the acceptance of, come with me. I don't care if they didn't want you. I don't care if you, if you got problems. That's why I'm here. I'm the physician. And so notice what they say the next day. Verse 40. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew. All right? This is Simon Peter's brother, Andrew. He was one of those two men. In verse 41, and he found first his own brother. He found Simon. Now, don't you know if you spent this, the night with Jesus, as soon as the sun came up, heck, you'd probably out before the sun, knocking on Peter's door. He's there, what, dude? you got to come. Look what he says. He said to Simon, we have found the Messiah. We found him. This is his story. You think Philip knows a whole lot about Jesus at this point? He's just spent one night with him. He doesn't know. You, you know way more about Jesus than Philip did at this point. You know so much more about Jesus that it probably makes uh, even what Philip could have known Real small. And notice, we found him. Look at it. Keep going. We found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. Right? This is the Greek word, Christ, of the Hebrew Messiah. Verse 42. And he brought him to Jesus, dragging, still in his PJs. Right? Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. Now think about that. He just met me. See, Jesus, is, he know, he's, he's intimately getting involved in these men's lives to the point where they now can't, they have to go share their story. Now here's what I love about this is that we all have a story. Christians, stop and, and think for a second. You have in, been encountered by the Spirit of God and He's changed your life. If you're a follower of Jesus, he's changed your life forever. You have a story. Are you sitting on it? Are you sitting on your story? Have you put it in your pocket? Because as soon as it gets out, you're going to be ridiculed, you're going to be made fun of, or maybe you're going to be marginalized at work. Don't sit on your story. Your job is to, be, is to let the Spirit move in you so that the excitement of what you've seen and what you've heard now flows and you've just got to go tell somebody. I love how Andrew told the most special person to him. I told his brother, the one he works with, the one he lives with, the one he's around all the time. I gotta, Peter's got to hear this. He's got to see this guy. In John, uh, John chapter 9, there's this amazing story of a man who was blind from birth and Jesus comes to him and he 
he spits on the ground and makes some uh, mud and puts it on his eyes and the guy goes and washes it off and the guy can see. And everybody begins to see that this was the guy that was born blind and they begin to freak out and he's, he's telling everybody, I don't, know who, I don't know who the man is, but a guy spit on the ground and, and rubbed it on my face and I can see. So much so that they take him before the Pharisees and they, he's standing there and he's, they say, tell us what happened to you. You are this guy, right? And he says, yeah, what happened? And he tells them the whole story and they don't believe him. And so they go get his parents and they bring his parents in and and his parents are like dude he's a grown man ask him we weren't there and so they go and get him again and they bring him in and they start really grilling him and he's like I told you this story you didn't believe me you kicked me out and he starts to tell them the story again and they start asking so many questions listen to this they start asking so many questions that the guy says wait 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 you guys want to be his disciples too and you know what they said to him they said are you Get out of here. We're disciples of Moses. And they kicked him out. What was he doing? He was just telling his story. But you know who came and found him after they kicked him out? Jesus. Hey, bro, remember me? I know you couldn't see me before, but (laughs) here I am. You recognize my voice? He says... Who are you? He says, I'm the son of God. Come on. You see this? You don't sit on your story. Even when the Pharisees are beating down your throat, even when the, 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 the world is coming at you, you don't sit on your story. And that's what disciples do. They share their story. Next thing you see in the text is they multiply. They are looking to, to make more disciples. Look at your text here. This is John... Verse 143 through 45, it says, The next day, he purposed to go into Galilee. Now, this is Jesus. He's, I'm going I'm to go from where I am up into Galilee. And this would be the, uh, the uh, western, north to, north to the western side of the Sea of Galilee would be this region. This is a purpose to go over there. And as he's going, he finds Philip. Now, here's what's interesting. Philip actually lived in a region that was near where Jesus grew up. So it's going to be weird that Philip doesn't necessarily know who Jesus is. And same thing with Nathaniel, who we're going to see in a second. But these guys hadn't, hadn't known who Jesus was, except to know maybe that, that his family lived here and he's the son of Joseph. They did not know him, as, as, as John said, too. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know he was the son of God. But notice this. So they're, um, they're going. They find Philip. And Jesus said to him, follow me. And now Philip was from Bethsaida, a city of Andrew and Peter. So he came and followed him. And Philip found Nathanael. And notice he says to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote. It's Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So he is, again, sharing his, his story. But notice what's happening. Jesus finds Philip. Philip finds Nathanael. It starts this viral movement of going and grabbing their buddies you got to come meet this guy. They are multiplying. Now, this is where I want us to, to take just a second, and I want us to take evangelism and discipleship, and I want us to look at them uh, head to head. Because I believe that evangelism is a component of discipleship. I think discipleship, personally, is this whole process from, from the first time you ever heard about Jesus to the time you die in Christ and see him face to face, we are being discipled, growing, learning how to fall more and more in love with God from the beginning to the end. Evangelism is this idea of seed throwing. Do you know what I mean by seed throwing? Like a, uh, like a farmer scattering seed. That's evangelism. But discipleship is this process of teaching and training and helping people experience God to fall more in love with him. Now, here's, here's, how, here's what I want to Let's do a little math for a second, okay? And maybe you've heard this illustration before, but I think it's very powerful. So let's just say that we are a church that evangelizes like crazy. I'm saying that you go out every single day and you have dedicated your life to doing nothing but sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ every single day. And let's just pretend that you share the gospel every day with 100,000 people. Now, that, now, that's impossible. I get it. But let's pretend like it's not. All right? You go out and share the gospel with 100,000 people, and let's give you a rate of return 
on your efforts of about 4%, okay? So every day, 100,000 people, and every day, 4% of that 100,000 people come to know Jesus Christ. That's amazing, right? Think about that. That's 4,000 people a day because of your efforts. Wow. Now, do you know how long it would take you to reach the world for Jesus Christ? 4,000 people a day. That's amazing. It would take you 5,250 years to reach the world for Christ. I mean, since we're making up numbers anyway, I mean, that's, but that's legit. Do the math. To reach about 7.6 billion people in 5,250 years. But hang on. What if you discipled one person? And not every day. Uh, or not, not, not 100,000 of them, but just one person a day, and you did it for a whole year. You and one person. You meet a couple times a week. You pray. You, do, you just do life together. You work, you bring them over. You take one person and you walk them through the Bible. You show them how to love their their wives or their husband. You show them how to be a good father. You show them how to be a follower of Jesus Christ in their business and and out in the world and in their school and in their community. And you disciple this person and make show them how to put Christ and the center of their life over and over and over again for a year. And then the next year, you and that person pick two more people. And you do that for a year. And then those two, right, you get, this is year three, there's now eight people doing it, right? Do you know how long it would take you to reach the entire world for the sake of Jesus Christ doing that model? It will take you 33 years. Now that's doable. Do you see the difference? Do you see why discipleship is such an integral part of who we are in Christ? Now let me ask you a question. Is that what you're asked to do? Is that what the Bible's commanded you to do? Is that what Jesus has told you to do? According to Matthew 28, it actually is. He tells the, the disciples to go. He tells his own to go. But how come the church hasn't figured that out? And don't raise your hand, but I want to ask you this question. How many of you here here are doing that? Don't raise your hand. And you know why I don't want you to raise your hand? Because I have a bad feeling (laughs) that we would be super embarrassed with ourselves. Disciples are multipliers. We go after those whom we love who are close to us and their friends and their friends. That's discipleship. It's not just come join my Bible study. I'm going to educate you and make you the smartest person with the biggest brain so that you can wow your friends with some incredible uh, theology and homiletics and hermeneutics and all this this stuff and apologetics so that you can have a big, fat brain which is worthless to the world. Unless you get out there and you start loving people, right? That's the point. Let's keep going. Verse 46, what you're going to see is not only are they they multipliers, but these are guys who are, are stepping out in a lot of faith. They're walking by faith. This is new territory for them. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I read that already? Philip goes, okay, they found Nathaniel. Yes, okay. So now in verse 46, Nathaniel said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? So notice, Philip's with Nathaniel. He's not with Jesus. They just, Philip found him. He says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nazareth must have had a reputation of being just a, kind of like, like uh, the lower uh, income area of town, right? It was the village where, uh, you know, maybe the, uh, it wasn't so nice. The streets had a lot of potholes. All right? And Philip said, come, come and see. This is what he's told us. This is what we've seen. He just said, I can't tell you. You're just going to have to come experience it. In verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him. And he said, and this gets freaky. Imagine if this happened to you. Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. And notice there's an exclamation point here because I believe the writer wanted it to, to be an, uh, that guy. Look at you. 
Man, you are an honest dude. And Nathanael said to him, how do, you, how, how do you know me? And Jesus said, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now, what's Jesus saying? What's Jesus saying? Jesus is saying that I have a supernatural ability that you don't get yet. But I actually knew where you were. I saw you. I know your whole life. I wonder if Jesus, from this point that we don't see in the text, if he went to him and was like, oh, yeah, you remember on your third birthday when you lit your curtains on fire accidentally, you know, with a birthday cake? <laughs> that was pretty funny, wasn't it? What? What? See my point? Look what he says. And Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, in other words, teacher, you're the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Now, now Nathaniel didn't necessarily have the full context of his divinity yet. He's going to get that later on. But at this point, he recognized him. If he can do this, he's got to be the guy we all think he is. He's got to be the Messiah. To make a statement like that with just that little information shows you the simplicity of Nathaniel's faith. The simplicity of it. The Bible says in Galatians 2.20, this is Paul talking to the church at Galatia. How are we to live? How are the disciples supposed to live? He says, I've been crucified with Christ. I don't live any longer. Christ lives in me. The life which I live now in the flesh, I live by what? I live by faith. Nathaniel paints from the very beginning, he paints the perfect picture of what the disciples are supposed to do. You're to walk by faith and not by sight. And Paul says, I live it by faith in the Son of God who loved me, gave himself up for me. That's who we're talking about. This is who this guy is. And then the last thing we see in the text here is that disciples see the way. They see the way. They're followers. They're committed. Uh, they share their story. They multiply. They walk by faith. But th they have an ability now. Because they followed, because they came and saw, now they're going to have a supernatural ability to actually see things the way God has ordered them to see things. He's going to now, the, the, the confusion of this world system that has been bred into our minds that we think uh, uh, everything that is now counterintuitive to how God has, has, has designed it to, to, to be, now it's going to be fixed and those who follow Jesus will now have their minds fixed to be able to see God and to know Him and to know who Christ is and to be able to understand now why they're here. Their whole purpose, everything, they'll see the way. Let's look at your text. In verse 50, Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? Like, that was really easy. It's like, wow, Nathaniel. That was really simple. You believe because I said that? Notice he says, you will see greater things than that, bro. You will see, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on me, on the Son of Man. Now what Jesus just does here is he goes back all the way to Genesis chapter 28 and he brings back the story of Jacob's ladder. You ever heard this story? Jacob is going back, and he's nervous. He's going back to meet his brother, and as he does, he, he's on his way, and he pulls up. He's going to take. He's going to sleep. It's nighttime, and he pulls up a rock, and he lays down. He puts his head on this rock, and, and as he's laying there, he has this vision as he sleeps of this ladder going all the way up to heaven and all the way down to earth, and angels ascending and descending on this ladder, ministering to him, and God saying, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of you. Not only that, but I'm going to, your descendants are going to be numerous and I'm going, to, I'm going to continue with you. I know you've done some bad things, but I'm going to take care of you. You're walking in faith now and that's what I'm excited about. I'm your God. And he saw these angels moving up and down on this ladder. Now, as Jesus explains this, who are these angels moving up and down on now? He says, you will see angels ascending and descending on me. In other words, I'm now the conduit. 
I'm the ladder. I'm the one that brings you connection to God. I am now the way that passes through. You, I am, as he says, I am the gate. I'm the one that holds this way. You're going to see greater things. You're going to see the way to God. And it's all things are going to be made right for you. So now we have to ask our final question, which is, why is this so important? To be quite honest, it, it may, in, in my opinion, discipleship may be one of the most, if not the most important thing that the church does correctly. And I, I've explained why that is earlier. But this is why I think it's so important. Without it, Christians are not focused on Christ. And let's just sit on that for a second. Without discipleship, you and I aren't focused on Christ. If we're not disciples, you know who we're actually... And, and I'm, I'm making a distinction between Christians and disciples here, okay? That's, that's what I'm doing. If you're sitting here and you're not following, if you're not multiplying, you're not committed, you're, just, you're, you're a Christian who has been saved and you've got your fire insurance policy of Jesus in your back pocket, I want you to know I truly believe that you're focused on yourself and you're not focused on Jesus. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, German... Uh, evangelist, Christian pastor, was murdered by the Nazis in World War II for conspiring. They felt like he was conspiring to kill Hitler. And so they, they murdered him. He wrote several books. One of them is called Life Together. And in this book, he has a quote, and I'm going to read it to you. It says this, Christians, excuse me, Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. This is why it's so important. There's a book I'm reading called The Trellis and the Vine. And uh, it's been it's really good. It's all about what a trellis does and what a vine does. And trellises, uh, it's funny, if you go Google trellises right now, you're going to see some really beautiful trellises on the images of Google. A trellis is a framework that's meant to hold the vine. And what we do as churches a lot of times is we build really amazing trellises. We build these beautiful trellises that we call the church, right? We build these trellises that we call the church and we put programs in place and, and we've got great ministries and great structures and all this stuff is moving. And oftentimes what churches do is we get caught up in the building of the trellis so much so that everything we do is about the trellis. And we forget that there's supposed to be a vine growing up this thing, right? See, the vine is, that's truly the church. That's the life. That's the thing that's, that's organic. It's alive. It's growing. And if we spend all of our time in just knowledge and gaining knowledge and looking how good we are, look how, how well we build this thing, and we don't actually grow vines as Christians if we're not discipling and making more disciples and growing vines, you know what we are? We're just a big, pretty trellis. I'll give you a couple of quotes and I want to be out. Discipleship is not about filling Christians with knowledge. It's about filling Christians with love. And I'll say this, discipleship is not about filling the church with people. but It's about filling the world with Christ. That's why we're here. Amen.